Mary Renault, Fire from Heaven. This is the first of uh, Mary Renault's uh, uh, trilogy about Alexander the Great and uh, an amazing book. This covers his childhood and youth. When Perdiccas asked him at what times he wished divine honors paid to him, he answered that he wished it done when they themselves were happy. These were the last words of the king. Quintus Curtius. One. The child was wakened by the knotting of the snake's coils about his waist. For a moment he was frightened. It had squeezed his breathing and given him a bad dream. But as soon as he was awake, he knew what it was and pushed his two hands inside the coil. It shifted. The strong band under his back bunched tightly, then grew thin. The head slid up his shoulder along his neck, and he felt close to his ear the flickering tongue. The old-fashioned nursery ramp, lamp, painted with boys bowling hoops and watching cockfights, burned low on its stand. The dusk had died in which he had fallen asleep. Only a cold, sharp moonlight struck down through the tall window patching the yellow marble floor with blue. He pushed down his blanket to see the snake and make sure it was the right one. His mother had told him that the patterned ones, with backs like woven border work, must always be let alone. But all was well. It was the pale brown one with the grey belly, smooth as polished enamel. When he turned four, nearly a year ago, he had been given a boy's bed five feet long, but the legs were short in case he fell, and the snake had not far to climb. Everyone else in the room was fast asleep, his sister Cleopatra in her cradle beside the Spartan nurse, nearer in a better bed of carved pear wood, his own nurse, Helenike. It must be the middle of the night, but he could still hear the men in hall singing together. The sound was loud and discordant, slurring the ends of the lines. He had learned already to understand the cause. The snake was a secret, his alone in the night. Even Lanika, so nearby, had not discerned their silent greetings. She was safely snoring. He had been slapped for likening the sound to a mason's saw. Lanika was not a common nurse, but a lady of the royal kindred, who remind him twice, reminded him twice a day that she would not be doing this for anyone less than his father's son. The snores, the distant singing, were sounds of solitude. The only waking presences were himself and the snake, and the sentry pacing the passage, the click of his armor buckles just heard as he passed the door. The child turned on his side, stroking the snake, feeling its polished strength slide through his fingers over his naked skin. It had laid its flat head upon his heart as if to listen. It had been cold at first, which had helped to wake him. Now it was taking warmth from him and growing lazy. It was going to sleep, and might stay till morning. What would Lanika say when she found it? He stifled his laughter, lest it should be shaken and go away. He had never known it to stray so far from his mother's room. He listened to hear if she had sent her women out in search of it. Its name was Glaucus. But he could hear only two men shouting at each other in the hall, then the voice of his father, the loudest, shouting them both down. He pictured her. In the white wool robe with yellow borders she wore after the bath, her hair loose on it, the lamp glowing red through her shielding hand, softly calling, Glaucus, or perhaps playing snake music on her tiny bone flute. The women would be looking everywhere, among the stands for the combs and paint pots, inside the bronze-bound clothes chests smelling of cassia. He had seen such a search for a lost earring. They would get scared and clumsy, and she would get angry. Hearing the noise from Hall again, he remembered his father did not like Glaucus, and would be glad that he was lost. It was then he resolved to bring him back to her now, himself. This must be done, then. The child stood in the blue moonlight on the yellow floor. The snake wound round him, supported in his arms. It must not be disturbed by dressing. But he took his shoulder cloak from the stool and wrapped it around both of them to keep it warm. He paused for thought. He had two soldiers to pass. Even if both turned out to be friends, at this hour they would stop him. 
He listened to the one outside. The passage had a bend in it, and a strong room was round the corner. The sentry looked after both doors. The footfalls were receding. He got the door unlatched and looked out to plan his way. A bronze Apollo stood in the angle of the wall on a plinth of green marble. He was still small enough to squeeze behind it. When the sentry had passed the other way, he ran. The rest was easy, till he got to the small court from which, the ro uh, from which rose the stair to the royal bedchamber. The steps went up between walls painted with trees and birds. There was a little landing at the top, and the polished door with its great ring handle in its lion's mouth. The marble treads were still scarcely worn. There had been nothing but a small harbour town on the lagoon at Pella before King Archelaus's day. Now it was a city, with temples and big houses. On a gentle rise, Archelaus had built his famous palace, a wonder to all Greece. It was too famous ever to have been changed. Everything was splendid, in a fashion fifty years old. Zeuxis had spent years painting the walls. At the stair foot stood the second entry, sentry, the royal bodyguard. Tonight it was Agis. He was standing easy, leaning on his spear. The child, peeping from the dark side passage, drew back, watching and waiting. Agis was about twenty, a lord's son of the royal domain. He had on his parade armour to wait upon the king. His helmet had a crest of red and white horsehair, and its hinged cheek flaps were embossed with lions. His shield was elegantly painted with a striding boar. It hung upon his shoulder, not to be put down till the king was safe in bed, and then not out of arm reach. In his right hand was a seven-foot spear. The child gazed with delight, feeling within his cloak the snake softly stir and twine. He knew the young man well. He would have liked to jump out with a whoop, making him throw up his shield and point his spear to be tossed up on his shoulder in reach of the tall crest. But Agis was on duty. It would be he who would scratch upon the door and hand Glaucus to a waiting woman. For himself, there would be Lanica and bed. He had tried before to get in at night, though never so late as this. They always told him nobody could enter except the king. The floor of the passage was made of pebble mosaic, checkered black and white. His feet grew sore from standing, and the night chill came on. Agis had been posted to watch the stairs, and only that. It was a different matter from the other guard. For a moment he considered coming out, having a talk with Agis, and going back but the slither of the snake against his breast reminded him that he had set out to see his mother. That, therefore, was what he was going to do. For a moment... Oops, where was I? Oh, here we go. <laughs> Sorry. If one kept one's mind upon what one wanted, the chance appeared. Glaucos, too, was magical. He stroked the snake's thin neck, saying voicelessly, Agatha Diamond, Sabazeus, Zagreus, send him away. Come, come. He added a spell he had heard his mother use, though he did not know what it was for. It was worth a trial. Agis turned from the stairs into the passage opposite. There was a statue a little way along of a lion sitting up. Agis leaned his shield and spear on it and went round behind. Though stone sober by cold reckoning, he had drunk before going on duty too much to hold till the next watch. All the guards went behind the lion. Lion, Before morning, the slaves would wipe it up. The moment he started walking, before he put down his weapons, the child knew what it meant and started to run. He flew up the cold, smooth stairs on silent feet. It always amazed him when the children of his own age, when with the children of his own own... When with children of his own age, how easily they could be outrun or caught. It seemed impossible they could really be trying. Agis behind the lion had not forgotten his duty. When a watchdog barked, his head went up at once. But the sound came from the other way. It ceased. He straightened his clothes and picked up his arms. The stairs were empty. And that's all we have time for because YouTube doesn't like us to go too long.